Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Environmental Health Australia's live chat event to celebrate a somewhat belated World Environmental Health Day 2023. World Environmental Health Day is the 26th of September each year. For various reasons, we've had to put this live chat together after the actual day, but the importance of environmental health is no less relevant today as it was then. Firstly, although our presentations today are spanning four countries and we have viewers from many, I would like to acknowledge the original inhabitants of the lands of Australia and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and those emerging. So what is environmental health and why are we celebrating environment, World Environmental Health Day? For anyone who is unsure, put simply, environmental health focuses on a person's health dependent on their environment. An army of environmental health professionals, including scientists and specialists in many areas of expertise, and especially environmental health officers, work to protect communities from environmental risks in a diverse range of areas like food safety, air quality, water quality for recreation and water for consumption, noise pollution, waste and effluent disposal, and diseases including vector-borne bacteria and viruses, and so much more. This year's theme for World Environmental Health Day is global environmental health standing up to protect everyone's health each and every day. Environmental health professionals, and particularly environmental health officers, are the protectors of our communities doing exactly that, protecting everyone's health each and every day from potential environmental hazards. The impacts of environmental <coughs> visibility are, the impacts of environment visibly and often silently on human health are everywhere, and noticeably through the now escalating impacts of climate change, are becoming better understood. To showcase the diversity of environmental health today, we're hearing from some fantastic environmental health professionals and we'll be opening up questions for a few minutes after each speaker's presentation. To ask a question, simply type a comment below. You're welcome to comment at any time and questions will be answered at the end of the speaker's presentation. Unfortunately, some of our speakers couldn't be with us in person, but they're still happy to take questions. Uh, just email questions to the email at the top of the chat and they will be passed on for you and be answered by the speaker. Our first speaker joining us from New Zealand is Tanya Morrison, National President of the New Zealand Institute of Environmental Health and an Environmental Health Officer in New Zealand for over 10 years. Tanya has joined us for a number of live chats and has contributed substantially to our cross-Tasman collaboration series of seminars. Her key interests within environmental health include tattooing, Swim, swimming pool, water quality, and food labelling. Welcome, Tanya. Well, good afternoon from my side of the ditch, Phil, and thank you so much for having me on for uh, for this year's live chat to celebrate World Environmental Health Day. Good to see you, Tanya. Thank you. Well, I wanted to take us through something a little bit different when it comes to environmental health officers, um, and I've entitled this presentation The Too Hard Basket because often that's exactly what we are. If you're not really sure um, a problem and who you can call, chances are you'll call your, your local council and the complaint will find its way to an environmental health officer. So we're problem solvers. I think that's a really good way to put it. And so thinking about the theme for this year's World Environmental Health Day of standing up to protect everyone's health each and every day, Health can be affected in a number of ways, and often ways that are not ones you may commonly think of. They can even be a little bit comical at times, and I hope to highlight a few of maybe the weird and slightly wonderful things that environmental health does cover and that environmental health officers do have to deal with in this presentation. For those not aware, we're a very versatile and um, broad profession. Um, and what we can throw our hand with in terms of a challenge, uh, there are no boundaries and there are nothing really off limits. So when it comes to protecting people's health, I can assure you, it is, even though some of the things I might take you through today may seem a little comical, it is no laughing matter in terms of how it can affect people's health. So if you've ever wondered or experienced any of the things I'm about to show you today, these are things that environmental health officers deal with all the time. Um, so you may also now take away from this that you've actually got someone to call. So we're going to start with an interesting one, which is noise. Now, noise generally, when you get a noise complaint and the way it affects our health, you probably think mostly a stereo noise, which is true, a loud party. I live in a student city with lots of tertiary university students who love a good party. That noise is possibly more obvious. What's less obvious 
is something like a crowing rooster. Now, a case that I was involved with a couple of years back was indeed about a crowing rooster. Now, this young fella had a great set of lungs on him, and it was a, a combination of over 10 years of a situation where a rural zoned piece of land was right next to residential housing. So the rooster was perfectly entitled to be there. The owner was perfectly entitled to have a rooster. In fact, nothing in New Zealand legislation says that you can't own any animal that you choose, including a rooster. However, the rooster didn't quite get the message there that not everybody likes to get up as early as he does. And so over the years, there was complaints coming in all the time from some of the nearby residential areas about being woken up at very early hours of the morning with the alarm clock that never has a snooze button. So this culminated eventually in us serving a notice on the rooster owner to try take the best practical option to try and keep the rooster as quiet as possible through housing, location, different mechanisms. I ended up actually putting a noise meter out for this rooster. Didn't tell him I was going to do that. I started my recording at 5 a.m. and by 10 past 5 in the morning, I had recorded 42 crows. Now, if you live next to that, you can well see why someone was extremely annoyed and the effects that that would have on your health. Sleep disturbance. Uh, a lot of coffee probably needed to be consumed. Um, so it can affect your mood, it can affect your concentration, can affect your productivity. Uh, nobody really wants to have that day after day, night after night, broken sleep by a rooster who just keeps waking you up. And the judge agreed with us when we went to court. And a long story short there is we got a positive result. So if someone actually got prosecuted, I would say in layman's terms for having a noisy rooster, but actually what they were prosecuted for was actually breaching their notice around how they kept that rooster because it was still causing a nuisance to other people. Now, the middle picture there is actually of a heat pump unit. We call it a heat pump here. In Australia, you might be calling it an air conditioning unit, kind of the same thing. This is one that often people don't think too much about. So when these are installed, um, installers will often put them on the side of the house that you as a homeowner don't want them to be on. You, you don't want it to be at the front of your house where people can see it. It's not a great look. You don't want to put this unit outside your own bedroom window. So you're probably going to put it on the part of the house that's really the furthest away from yourself. What tends to happen, though, is that it's usually directly opposite your neighbor's bedroom window. And so heat pumps with a cyclical noise that go on and off and click on, click on, on and off throughout the night. Um, it's a very cyclical thing, but it can actually keep people awake all night long. So again, how do we deal with this? You might just say it's easy to move the heat pump unit, but I can assure you that's not easy at all. The cost and the, uh, and the actual actions involved to do that are actually quite substantial in terms of regassing the unit and finding somewhere better to put it. So there's a lot of things we have to work through here in the two hard basket. What settings do we run the fan on? What time of day is it used? Is there a problem with the fan unit itself? Can we baffle it? Can we screen it? So there's a lot of options that we have to now deal with, may include noise monitoring, um, working with our complainant, working with our heat pump owner. These complaints are never easy and they're never quick. And you might be wondering why the last picture there is of a, a nice woolly sheep and a lamb. I can assure you that's not because of a Kiwiism joke with the Aussies here about our, our love for sheep. Believe it or not, we've actually had complaints about bleating lambs before in the middle of the city. Now, upon hearing that, you might think, why is a lamb in the middle of the city? Which, to be honest, was the very first question I asked as well, when it was actually a bunch of university students who actually put this complaint in, trying to study for their exams, which is good to hear, because they're usually the ones causing most of the noise in our city here with their stereos and their loud parties, but they couldn't concentrate because of a bleating lamb in a neighbor's backyard all day long. So why was the lamb even there? So the owners of this house wanted to educate their young children about what animals were and just how to care for animals. So they had a friend that owned a farm and decided what better way to expose their children to these things than to get the lamb to come and visit for a while. My initial response to that was perhaps we could have taken the children out to the farm instead would have been more appropriate. And I'm happy to say that that is the result that we achieved at the end of the day. It is not appropriate to keep a lamb in the middle of a backyard in the middle of a city. Again, a great example of the two hard basket. Some chief negotiating skills right there to actually make sure we got a good result for everyone all round, all round including the lamb. So what about this situation here? This is where we look at hoarding and squalor. Now, if you live next to this, 
you may not be very impressed about it from a visual point of view. These are never easy cases. If someone has this uh, behaviour in terms of a mental disorder where they are hoarding um, and there's a lot of rubbish and materials present, it's not a case of going in there with a big dump truck and actually just clearing it out. More often than not, that does not solve the problem. And you really need to engage with the people involved, the person who's actually doing this, to get them on board. It is a mental health issue, and there are many moving parts to these situations. Many agencies are likely to be involved. Age concern workers, perhaps, social workers, maybe building control or inspectors, city planners, your commercial cleaners, or waste companies. Friends and family are some of the most important people who can be involved here of the person who actually lives in this home. So you're battling the mentality of my house, my castle, my right to do what I want to do on my land. But if you live next door to this, you might get some smell issues, you might see an increase in rodents or pests, and certainly it's not a great thing visually to look at. But it's also not something that can be solved in five minutes. Welcome to the too hard basket. Now you might be wondering why I've got a bit of an animal theme going on here today. I told you it was the weird and the wonderful. Um, when it comes to horse or pigs, another common complaint we have to deal with is odour. Now often we see, and especially with uh, some subdivisions going up around, I'm sure this is no different in Australia too, you get the meeting of rural and rural residential and residential um, backing onto each other. So as cities and towns expand, now we start encroaching and putting more houses out into what was farmlands. And people, believe it or not, even though they've just built a house there, they don't want to live next door to a horse or a pigsty where indeed there is a smell present. So who's in the right here and who's in the wrong? The animals are just doing their thing, that's fine. But again, if you had a strong smell and you're exposed to that for a long length of time, it will start to affect your health especially once you've tuned into something like this, it's like the, dark, the barking dog that you just can't help but keep hearing. You're going to keep smelling this and then you'll become quite fixated on it from a complainant's point of view. So how do we deal with this? So as environmental health officers, we would look at multiple factors called the FIDAL factors, which is frequency, intensity, duration, offensiveness and location. Believe it or not, we know how to calibrate our noses. There's a raft of tools we can use. We can analyze the smell from multiple locations, plot it all on graphs. We can go quite scientific with this, believe it or not. But at the end of the day, it's about having conversations and trying to work the problem and find a solution that's going to make everybody happy, including the animals. And then everyone's favorite, the rubbish. Again, I'm from a student city. I do see this a lot, unfortunately. Now rubbish complaints can take many forms. It can just be piled up rubbish bags like you see on your screen there in a front or a rear yard that attract the cats, the rats, the dogs. It can have smell, it can have flies, it can lead to all sorts of problems, especially in heavy weather events. And again, it's not a pleasant sight and something that anybody wants to live next to. But dumped rubbish on public land such as reserves, playgrounds, road verges, or even on more semi-rural properties where People might just chuck this over their neighbor's fence and hope they don't notice. This actually happens a lot, and it happens within cities as well. So if you didn't see who did it, what do you do? And even if you did see who did it, is that enough evidence for us to do anything about it? In New Zealand, whether you put it there or not, if this is on private land, it is the landowner's responsibility. And you can imagine that is an interesting conversation to have that whilst you didn't put the rubbish there, you are responsible for making sure it gets removed. And there's obviously a lot of cost and some not so nice parts of the practicalities of actually having to remove that in some situations. But nevertheless, that's the way the law reads in New Zealand anyway, that on private land, you have to remove it. On public land, it does normally default to your local council, but ultimately this means that your rate and taxpayers are actually funding the removal. Yet again, we're in the too hard basket. Often it's hard to find who the owner is, and even if you can find something that identifies who or might have put that rubbish there, it can be very hard to pin them down. At the end of the day, it's another problem that needs to be solved. So what I've taken you through is a real highlighted snapshot of just some of the examples of what we have to deal with. I can assure you there are many, many more. So I would like to just end with saying, 
a little bit like Ghostbusters, but who are you going to call? It's probably going to be an environmental health officer. As a profession, we'll take on the tough problems. We'll take on those frustrating complaints. Sometimes we'll take on, frankly, the outrageous and the interesting ways that people choose to live. But when it affects other people's health and it can impact how you actually choose to live and enjoy the peace and comfort of your own environment, that's where we try to come in and help. We are a multi-skilled workforce. We are willing to throw our hand at the strangest and the trickiest of situations. Basically, we worry so you don't have to. What I can tell you is that environmental health officers, we are problem solvers and we love a good challenge. Our role is very variable, our skill set is wide, and the problems that we get tasked with sometimes are extremely unique. But that's why we love what we do. That's why we love environmental health. It's a very important profession, albeit often a silent one. So here's to all the environmental health officers worldwide. Keep doing what you're doing, even though it might be the weird, the wonderful, and the outright strange. Keep up the good mahi, the good work, because you never know that next too hard basket complaint is probably hitting your inbox as we speak. Happy to take any questions if there's any that come through, but thank you again to Environmental Health Australia for having me join your uh, Environmental Health Day World um, live chat today. It's always a pleasure to be involved. Thank you, Tanya. Tanya, you've highlighted that a lot, of we, a lot of what we do is related to compliance, but also that there are some huge areas of grey and a lot of um, communication issues, particularly those things dealing with the, the grey areas um, and, and particularly around the, uh, per, how people behave in those situations. Did you have any comment for professionals about that, that side of it and, and dealing with those issues? Yeah, for sure. It's... Um... It's funny when you study to become an environmental health officer, I don't think even in your degrees, the same as in New Zealand, do you ever see a paper on what to do when you get a smelly pig complaint or a pile of rubbish. Um, but what you probably would get is to have really good communication skills. Um, from our side of things, taking good notes and record keeping and collecting evidence comes with the territory and goes without saying. But communication wise, you need to have some empathy, you need to have some sympathy, and you have to be able to listen gather all the facts and work the problem. And I think any um, any professional would be well aware of that too, that you can't jump to conclusions, you just need to actually um, take it one step at a time and work through it. Thanks, Tanya. We've got a comment there from uh, Tudor Tanasi. Uh, it's the capacity to think out of the box and mediate a good outcome, which sorts out 90% of the problems. I couldn't agree with that more. So thanks yeah. for that comment. Same here. Yeah, often someone just being heard with their concern, even if there's nothing you can actually do about it, whether the legislation just doesn't allow you to or the complaint isn't actually substantiated. But when people feel heard and that you've tried your best, um, it can go a long way to appease a situation. Yeah, I, I think you're very right, Tanya. I think the, the importance of communication and face-to-face and -face communication can't be underestimated in those situations. And um, it's yeah, extremely important to... Um, to make that contact um, something the profession does very well. So um, no further questions, nothing's popping up there. So thank you for taking the time to join us today, Tanya. Um, all the best over there in New Zealand. I know you need to shoot off to another appointment, um, so we won't keep you, but um, thanks very much for joining us today. Much appreciated. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Phil. Now we'll be hearing from Karen Lawrence. Karen is a committed, enthusiastic environmental health officer who currently holds the role of Assistant Manager, Aboriginal Environmental Health Unit, New South Wales Health. She's passionate about improving processes in social housing management and supporting the enhancement of environment, the environmental health profession. Having worked in Indigenous environmental health, I know the sorts of issues that Karen's dealing with and um, it is a very challenging area, um, but um, welcome, Karen. Phil. <clears throat> and uh, sorry, but I don't have any pig pictures. I think Tanya's well and truly outdone me with photos today. Uh, thank you. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Biripai land. The Biripai people are the traditional custodians of the land that I'm sitting on here. And I'd like to acknowledge their connection and knowledge of the land, the birds, the water, the animals for tens of thousands of years. So I work for the State Health Department in New South Wales here in Australia. Uh, and over the last 
couple of decades, New South Wales Health has been working hard on creating an environmental health workforce uh, and specifically pathways for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to enter into this fantastic profession of environmental health. And we've been doing this work so that, as our World Environmental Health Day theme says, so that we have people out there working in local councils like Tanya and her teams over there in New Zealand to stand up and protect the health of people every day. So I'm just going to describe what we've been doing and what we've achieved. There is great demand for environmental health officers out there. There are some jobs that are advertised that there's great difficulty getting any applicants for. There's rural areas across New South Wales and across Australia where there's only a few qualified or experienced environmental health officers. So we really do need to work to try to ensure that we have people out there like these trainees learning to become qualified environmental health officers. So in New South Wales Health, we actually have two current programs to enhance our environmental health workforce and address the supply uh, issue that we have at the moment and, and get more great people into this profession. The first program that we have, which has now been running for 25 years, is the Aboriginal Environmental Health Officer Training Program. Uh, these are actually really cadetships in today's language, uh, but we call them traineeships. And each of these traineeships goes for about six years. And it involves Aboriginal people being employed and doing their university studies part time. Uh, and that's why it takes six years, because it takes six years to get through that uni degree. Uh, these uh, traineeships through the Aboriginal Environmental Health Officer Training Program have addressed some issues of succession planning for local government in New South Wales. It's allowed local councils to grow their own environmental health officers and helps with local employment. It also helps local government address some workforce targets for themselves in employing Aboriginal people on their workforce. The second program that we have just started in New South Wales Health is the scholarship program for Aboriginal people to become environmental health officers. This is only in its third year, and, and I'll have a little bit more to say that, about that at the end of my talk. Both these programs help us address our national closing the gap target we have in Australia by encouraging Aboriginal people and increasing the number of Aboriginal people that are attending tertiary education. The Closing the Gap strategy in Australia addresses and acknowledges the disparity between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people across a range of areas, and that includes inclusion in university. Across these two programs, New South Wales Health, we, we take quite a quality improvement approach. We learn each year and try to improve on these programs as much as we can to ensure that we're providing the best opportunity for people to become great environmental health officers. Currently, we have eight trainees at various places across New South Wales and they're the red dots and the blue dots are where we've had trainees in the past. Trainees are predominantly in our program employed by local councils and they gain their work experience there but they also spend a bit of time with their regional public health units uh, on work experience and placements. But we do also have a couple of trainees at the moment who are employed by our regional public health units and they get work experience and placements with local councils. And in the 25 years that our training program has been running, we started where there were no Aboriginal people who were environmental health officers in New South Wales. And as of this year, we have had 23 people graduated as qualified environmental health officers. This is a diagram that shows some of the governance and, and the various components of the Aboriginal Environmental Health Officer training program that we have. And these are things that we've developed over the last 25 years. We acknowledge that on the way in, on the left-hand side of the image here, it's important to support the employers understand what the training program is. So we hold meetings, we have a funding agreement, uh, recruitment packs with templates and things. And then once a traineeship is established, we very firmly, that red dot in the centre, we hold the trainee and the supervisor central to the program. Around them in the, the light green, we have the various people that 
and, and people processes that support the trainee and support the supervisor with information sessions, um, steering group meetings, points of contact. And in the darker green, we've got a range of documents and uh, processes and things to support the trainee and the supervisor in their workplaces. So work plan templates and we hold workshops and encourage trainees and supervisors to attend you know, national conferences. We have forums, communication through Microsoft Teams and specific channels and all sorts of guidance documents. Uh, on the way out of this program, we have trainees who qualify with a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Health and they get a certificate and we do a review and closure. We try to ensure across the training program that we have cultural respect embedded in all aspects of the program. And we do have an, an overarching committee to sort of guide what we do. We know that not every environmental health officer is, is a born supervisor. So we're trying to put as much support in place for the supervisors in the various um, local councils and public health units. And we know that not every organisation has has had trainees before or cadets before. So we try to assist the organisations with lots of documents. One of the documents that we have is a workplace training kit, <clears throat> excuse me. And this is to support the trainees and the supervisors by identifying various skills across 19 workbooks that these trainees should have experience of uh, throughout their traineeship as we're trying to develop well-rounded EHOs. Each workbook has some theory questions and then a series of tasks described that the, the trainees um, should do or undertake throughout the course of their six-year traineeship. We offer um, quite some, some good funding at the moment and New South Wales Health funds 100% of the costs and expenses for these traineeships. That's all of their salaries and wages and other on costs. And then for the subsequent years of the traineeships, we share those costs 50-50 with the employer. We also support the trainees by funding 100% of their uni fees for every subject that they satisfactorily pass. And so the other program that we're running is the scholarship. We've developed this scholarship uh, and developed a manual for us to follow. Um, and applicants can put in applications at any time with scholarships being offered in November for study the subsequent year. Uh, we reimburse the university fees for successful um, subjects for the scholarship recipients. And we also give them $250 a semester. So this is obviously a much cheaper program for New South Wales Health to run but we're trying to uh, have the same outcome in supporting Aboriginal people to become environmental health qualified people. Uh, this is a snippet from one of our social media campaigns, this year's campaign, which is actually closing later on this week. Uh, so we've used social media, which has been a, an interesting uh, bit of learning for us in New South Wales Health. Uh, and the first year we offered six scholarships but none of those people ended up being enrolled in uni. The second year, we offered three people scholarships and we've had one of those uh, people enrolled. So we have one scholarship recipient we're supporting at the moment and we're hoping that this week we have a couple more. So, look, I encourage your organisations to consider creating or offering scholarships or traineeships. And if you're an individual out there uh, who might know someone that might be interested, I, I encourage you to share the jobs as they come up on, on our website uh, or scholarships as they come up. We tend to run a campaign each year. We know that through our training program, we have, we have helped address some institutional racism that we've seen out there. We know that we've instigated Aboriginal cultural awareness training in a number of employers where that hadn't happened before. And we know that we've given a whole lot of people an opportunity in life to get to uni and to, to come into this great profession of environmental health. Um, we now have environmental health officers who are working as senior EHOs in local councils 
and are supervising their own trainee. So we've got graduates from our training program passing on their skills and knowledge to the next generation, which is, which is really exciting. Uh, so in closing, I'd like to acknowledge my supervisor and mentor when I was uh, an up and coming EHO, uh, Murray Murphitt and, and Bob Hanby were both very important in the early days of my profession. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge Jeff Standen, who's pictured here in this photo, who has grown uh, the Aboriginal Environmental Health Officer Training Program and supported the scholarship program uh, so that we can uh, put more, more EHOs out on the ground out there to be working every day. Um, and thank you, Phil, Sam and EHA for hosting another live chat for us. Thanks very much, Karen. Um, I, th I don't think there's any surprises amongst the profession that um, workforce is a major issue at the moment. In fact, it's one of the things our national boards highlighted. Um, and having just been overseas, I can assure you that uh, even in places like the US, there is a huge shortage when it comes to environmental health people. So congratulations on being able to run scholarship type programs. And I couldn't agree more with any proposals for cadetship, internship, I have been a little bit like a scratch record in recent months about this. I really feel that every local government um, pretty much in Australia should have a trainee EHO at the moment because the shortages are very real. Um, you mentioned cultural um, awareness and respect. Um, did you have any comments on things like sorry time um, and how that's addressed? For, for people that don't know, sorry time in Indigenous communities is a period of mourning following the death of a, a relative. And quite often um, in the in the past, I've had Indigenous workers that have had to have go away for some time to uh, for that period of mourning to go to other communities and things like that. Did you have any comment on that, Karen? We certainly make sure in talking with all of our employers that they acknowledge that there might be aspects of their cadets or trainees' lives that is different to theirs. Uh, and particularly, we have a number of councils where these cadets and trainee EHOs are the first Aboriginal person in the professional workplace. There might be Aboriginal people working for council and the outdoor staff, but not so much, you know, in the office. So it's certainly something that we bring to the attention of the employers and ensure that they are aware that there might be cultural requirements of their staff that they've not had to think about before. And so as long as there's good, clear, open communication between the employer and the employee, uh, we haven't had any problems that haven't been able to be addressed so far. So yeah, everything comes down to communication uh, and, and consideration. But it's been very exciting to see local councils take on, you know, with great enthusiasm, running some Aboriginal cultural awareness training in their organisations where they haven't had it before. So uh, I see, you know, of great hope uh, for our society uh, along with hopefully whatever happens this coming week in, in Australia. Okay, thanks very much for your presentation, Karen. We haven't had any questions pop up there, but if anyone does have a, have a question, then you can all, or a thought afterwards, you can always email that through and um, uh, Karen will be more than happy to answer. Um, but thanks again so much for your time this morning, Karen, and I uh, wish you all the best. Thanks, Phil. All right, we're off to Malaysia now. So we're now joined by Dr. Farah Yeni Shafi from Malaysia. Dr. Farah is an associate professor at the Centre for Aber Environmental Health and Safety Studies under the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University Technology MARA. She has been teaching environmental health and safety courses at undergraduate and postgraduate level for the past 14 years. So welcome, Farah. Hi, Phil. Thank you for the introduction. All right, uh, a very good morning to everyone. And um, as Phil mentioned, I'm Farah from uh, the Malaysian Association of Environmental Health, MAE. Uh, I'm also an uh, associate professor at a Center for Environmental Health and Safety Studies, Faculty of Health Sciences, University Technology Mara, or widely known as UITM. Uh, we are based in Puncha Alam campus and um, I'm also the Assistant Honorary Secretary of MAE and also a lifetime member of MAE. So first of all, I would like to um, thank EHA for giving us a platform for MAE to, to share our uh, good works over here. 
and um, I'll also share a little bit on the World Environmental Health Day celebration uh, that has been going on in Malaysia and also uh, in the upcoming few weeks. Uh, Sam, on the next slide, please. Right, that's uh, the brief introduction from me. And next one. So um, I hope it's not too late to wish everybody a happy World Environmental Health Day. Uh, so that's our president, Mr. Magat Azman Magat Mokta, the president of Malaysian Association of Environmental Health. So we are very happy to have um, Ma'e on this platform today. And the next one, Sam. All right, for the introduction, MAE is a professional body representing practitioners in the field of environmental health. Uh, MAE is also an associate member after the, uh, under the International Environmental Health, IFA, and also a training, re training center registered under the Charter Institute of Environmental Health. So MAE provides uh, consultation and training to organizations and individuals in the field related to environmental health. Next one, uh, the next one, I think, yeah. So this is the Management Council of MAE for the 2021 to 2023 session. So we'll be having our biannual general meeting very soon This uh, before the end of this year for the new council to, to resume. All right, thank you. Next one. All right, this is some brief introduction on uh, MAE and IFE. Um, MAE is a... Uh, of course, the associate member of IFA, and we have been supporting uh, IFA ever since the founding meeting in 1982. And uh, Malaysia was selected to host uh, the the third IFA World Congress in of Environmental Health in uh, PWTC in Kuala Lumpur. And quite um, recent in 2022, we were honored again for the second time to host the 16th IFA World Congress on Environmental Health in Kuala Lumpur. And that's how I got to meet uh, Phil uh, uh, in KL, in Kuala Lumpur. And we had a really good uh, session, uh, sharing sessions, networking, and uh, discussing how to go forward uh, in the open paper sections, uh, sharing from all the environmental health uh, practitioners from all over the world. Next page, uh, Sam. So that's some photos from the World Congress. We have uh, all the participants, all the IFA council members joining in. We had uh, good discussions over with the academic members and also sharing sessions from uh, practitioners in Malaysia and also abroad. And um, exactly a year after that, one of the um, good thing that coming out from the discussion was um, the Malaysia summer camp where the Australian National University students and two accompanying staff, uh, Dr. Andrew Matheson and his colleague, uh, they came over to Malaysia for two weeks for the summer camp, uh, exposing the students to environmental and public health uh, facilities and services uh, that we have here in Malaysia. So they had a little bit of uh, biodiversity exposure in our Royal Bloom State Park, looking at the uh, environmental health uh, initiatives with the rural um, and Aboriginal people, giving them the health care, giving them the disease control prevention and uh, community services. So I think this is one of the good things coming out from the World Congress where we had this uh, international platform uh, engaging the local students from, from Malaysia and also from the Australian National University ANU. We also uh, welcome um, practitioners and students of environmental health to, to come and visit us in Malaysia and get to know what we are doing on a daily basis. Um, you know, doing things on environmental health uh, issues. And um, they, they were here for like two weeks. So we are welcoming all of you, uh, practitioners and students of environmental health to Malaysia. Next one, please, Sam. Right, so ever since uh, the declaration of World Environmental Health Day in 2011, MAE and Malaysia in general, uh, we have been celebrating and commemorating this uh, World Environmental Health Day teams for the past 11 years. So um, we are very happy. We are very happy to see the celebration at the 
um, national level, at the ministry level, at the local authorities level, and even uh, in the public uh, level, university levels. And uh, we are you know, continuing to do that. Um, next one, please, Sam. All right, so this is uh, the top 10, just sharing the top 10 priority list of environmental health issues in Malaysia. So we can see here that children's environmental health uh, vector-borne diseases and contamination of drinking water sources have been identified as the top three major and growing environmental threats in Malaysia that warrant urgent intervention. So this was revealed in the Health Ministry's National Environmental Health Action Plans uh, latest publication, the priority list of environmental issues in Malaysia. So we have a list of uh, detailing 10 key, concern, 10 key concerns uh, developed by the thematic working group of uh, environmental health experts. So you can see here the children's environmental health, vector-borne diseases, we're dealing with uh, dengue and uh, the re emerging of malaria and contamination of drinking water sources and emerging of water pollutants, including the endocrine disrupting chemicals and pharmaceutical drugs, the urban health issues, climate change, food safety and contamination, human exposure to pesticides and other environmental chemicals, zoonotic diseases, exposure to ionizing and non-ionizing radiations, and finally, exposure to fine particles in the air pollution. So we are going. I'm going to share a little bit of the celebration that's going on uh, in um, all over Malaysia. So this is one of it at the Municipal Council of Batu Pahat. And uh, for the first time ever, we had um, this organized by the Sultana Nora Ismail Hospital in collaboration with MAE and the Batu Pahat Municipal Council. So among the conducted activities were uh, aerobic exercises to commence the brisk activity. We need to move a little bit more, symbolizing the 10,000 steps program. So all the invited uh, guests and participants walk along the designated route within hospital area. Uh, there's a lush uh, greenery and captivating scenery within the hospital grounds. So the, because the hospital is uniquely situated within a park, a hospital in a park actually, with two prominent mountains serving as landmarks for the Batu Pahat district. And we also have celebration. Uh, we'll be having the celebration next uh, this week actually with the Shah Alam City Council. Oh, sorry, this one is at Kuala Lumpur City Council. So we had this celebration uh, last week. So all the environmental health officers uh, came together giving the support towards uh, a poster and um, exhibition held in, in the Kuala Lumpur City Hall. So it's everybody's, you know, coming together and sharing what they're doing on a daily basis. Next one, please. And we'll also be having uh, another celebration at Shah Alam City Council. Uh, we have some forum, uh, pocket talk on toxic environment as trigger to silent diseases and also pocket talk on the black soldier fly. Also uh, uh, emerging um, sustainable practice uh, using black soldier fly to decompose uh, solid uh, food waste. So this is also an ongoing research going on at uh, my university in UITM. So it's good to share with the community as well on what we are doing and the potential of this uh, approach. So MAE has also in, uh, organized a Corporate Social Response Project, CSR, uh, protect the environment and conserve the ecosystem at an, an island here in the north region of Malaysia in Pulau Pangkor. So we had uh, everybody, the students coming in, uh, the private agencies such as uh, Alam Flora, the one who are uh, managing uh, solid waste. And we had uh, beach cleaning as well. And uh, everybody's very happy with the, the outcome of this project. Next one, please. All right. We also uh, we are also having um, a national uh, celebration. Actually, um, the team for uh, celebrating the team of the World Environmental Health Day, uh, highlighting the global significance of environmental health and ongoing uh, commitment to safeguarding public health and environmental health. 
uh, emphasizing collective responsibility to ensure the well-being of all individuals and the need for continuous effort to address environmental health challenges worldwide. So this is the biggest event that we'll be having um, uh, next week, actually. So we are having oral and poster presentation um, for all the environmental practitioners in the ministry, in the local authority, uh, in the uh, from the universities as well. Uh, the uh, any private and government agencies are all welcome to join this uh, session. So we'll be having a scientific conference uh, with uh, in conjunction with the World Environmental Health Day. So the past couple of weeks, uh, we have witnessed celebration of World Environmental Health Day at various government agencies at ministry and local authority level. And the upcoming weeks as well, we have the scientific conference going on. But we are very happy to share that uh, for the first time ever, uh, we have a um, uh, private agency, which is Petronas here, uh, doing and celebrating World Environmental Health Day with the team Product Stewardship and Toxicology, our commitment towards sustainability. Uh, they are, we are very happy to see Petronas as one of the largest and most prominent state-owned uh, enterprise in Malaysia, recognized globally as a major player in the, industri in the energy industry. So the participation of Petronas, a major private agency in World Environmental Health, it simplifies uh, the growing recognition of the private sector's role in environmental health and sustainability. As a global energy company, Petronas uh, likely acknowledges its responsibility to address environmental health uh, issues and promote sustainable uh, practices in its operation. So we are very happy to see the way forward for Petronas as they are also now um, offering uh, jobs position uh, as environmental health executives, uh, especially looking at um, the environmental health and toxicology issues uh, with the workers and uh, in the entire operation as a whole. So this is uh, really, um, I think MAE, the universities has also uh, played our roles in promoting uh, environmental health. And now it has come to a point that even the private uh, sector, the corporate sector is now joining us, uh, taking up the, the effort and the shared responsibility. So um, I think uh, MAE plays a pivotal role in aligning its objective with the United Nations uh, SDGs in the spirit of World Environmental Health Day. So we are committed to environmental and public uh, well-being resonates with various SDGs, including uh, clean water and sanitation, good health and well-being, sustainable cities and communities, and responsible consumption and production. So through our initiatives and collaboration, MAE uh, actively contributes to advancing these goals and for emphasizing the importance of a clean and healthy environment for the current and future generations. So this is just some um, activities that we are doing uh, with the university uh, where MAE held this uh, Urban Health Forum together with the focus group discussion. So discussing uh, issues on urban health the current issues, um, as you can see in the top uh, priority list in of environmental issues in Malaysia. So with this forum serve as a vital space uh, for experts, practitioners, stakeholders to convene, exchange ideas, and strategize on addressing urban health challenges, which are inherently linked to environmental health concerns. And we have... Um, uh, the MAE uh, Journal of Environmental Health, as you can see here, um, we uh, we are publishing uh, twice a year. So all the environmental health uh, practitioners from uh, all over the world are uh, welcome to send in your technical reports, uh, any studies that you might be uh, doing or would like to share with the environmental health practitioners. So this is an ongoing uh, publication. Uh, you can see the next uh, in the next slide is the link to the journal. So we have uh, issues um, in areas such as air quality, drinking water quality, food safety, and uh, there's a whole list over there. So everybody is welcome to write in. And um, the outcome from the focus group discussion from the MAE Urban Health Forum is also published here. So the latest one is already uh, online at the website. So 
through this integrated approach, um, it underscores my commitment to advancing environmental goals and promoting urban well-being and disseminating valuable knowledge to broader community, contributing significantly to the achieving of uh, SDGs and celebrating the essence of the World Environmental Health Day programs that we had uh, at international level. We had the we have the F, uh, FGD, the focus group discussion on discussing the role of environmental health in the private sector. And therefore, we are so happy to see the movement by Petronas, one of the biggest uh, corporate sector, you know, leading the way for other private agencies to come and join us uh, with the environmental health initiatives. Yeah, and uh, that's our context for MAE. If you'd like to collaborate, um, in anything we are open and we're always um i think a uh, would know i feel would know that uh, Ma'e is always um giving our best uh for our environmental practitioners and also our students right next one just sharing the uh, work that we're doing in in uitm in the center for environmental and safety studies we are offering our postgraduate um courses at uh, uitm for uh, in the form of coursework or taught courses and also by research program. So we have um, environmental health uh, lecturers who are also researchers in environmental health. And we are open to welcome students from all over the world for the post postgraduate level, both in taught courses and also by research courses and also at PhD levels. So if you need more information, you can contact me and there's also some links over there. And I think, yeah, that's it, uh, Sam, from me and Ma'e. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Farah. It was uh, good to see you again. Yeah, and, good uh, to Thanks see very you. much for your presentation. It's never too late to celebrate. So, um, yes, in, in answer to your question. Um, I think we've got... Uh, there's a question come up there from Crystal Merlo. She's saying, uh, do you, is Malaysia suffering a shortage of environmental health professionals as in Australia? Yeah, I think uh, it's a growing concern over the world as well. As for Malaysia, um, I think we have we have the, the graduates coming out from various uh, public and, and private universities. It's just that the post, the... the, the vacancies available at the ministry level at the local authority level you know we can always uh, do more about that phil and uh, crystal and we are open for more discussion as to see the the potential of having all these positions open up in you know larger larger uh, potential and in the private and also in the public field there's always we need more and more actually with the growing concerns that we have in Malaysia. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Dr. Farah. I mean, I think one of the good things that we've been able to do is to use the postgraduate stream to, to supply environmental health officers um, of into the profession in recent years. And that, that's certainly been the case in Australia. But yes, I think uh, Malaysia is no different to Australia, no different to New Zealand and elsewhere. So um, I think we're all, uh, we can all have uh, plenty of more, plenty more EHOs coming to the profession over the coming years. I don't think there's uh, any reason why we shouldn't be pursuing that, and particularly things like Karen's previous presentation on on um, interns yeah. and graduates, um, graduate programs is a great idea. So, thank you again for your presentation. Um, much appreciated. Um, of course, yeah. I extend an invitation to all the people from Malaysia to come down to Perth for the World Congress in May next year. Hopefully, we'll see you there. Yeah, we really hope we really hope so, Phil. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation, and all the best. I just want to take a moment now to thank our speakers who are able to join us live this morning, uh, Tanya, Karen, and Dr. Farah. Um, our next two presentations have been pre-recorded, as both uh, Dr. Damika Magana Arachi and Dr. Greg Whiteley have previous engagements this morning. The next presentation is from Dr. Greg Whiteley, who is an active researcher, author, speaker on surface contamination, particularly focusing on superbugs, biofilms within healthcare settings. 
Um, Greg's been a great advocate for the profession over many years. Um, he's been acknowledged uh, by Environmental Health Australia. He's uh, sat on our national board previously and um, he's uh, an absolute stalwart of the profession. So without further ado, uh, we'll begin his presentation. Uh, thanks, Sam. The, um, the whole area of microbiology is, is changing like a lot of sciences. And as we're moving forward, it's very different from where I learned about microbiology as an undergraduate at Hawkesbury, I must say, all those many decades ago. And, um, and the area that where it's changing is how we understand what uh, bacteria in particular, but also fungi do in their native environment. Now, when we grow them in a laboratory or particularly when we were undergraduates, we'd grow them in a test tube and it was like sending them on holidays to a South Pacific Island resort. I mean, there's lots to eat. It was lovely and warm. There's breeding going on everywhere. You know, they're all having a happy time. But if you really want to see what they do, you have to mimic what happens in real life. And what happens in real life is the tough love of evolution. And as we've moved into the modern era of looking at modern genetics, as well as modern uh, microbial uh, analytical systems, including much better uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy and all sorts of different microscopic methods and staining methods, we now realise there's an array of things that happen and it's actually highly relevant for environmental health officers uh, because I know as a, someone that was an EHO years and years ago working as one, you would see contamination and uh, we now know that you're probably seeing biofilms and biofilms are not just a biological material, or, or, you know, or a, a biological soil. Biofilm is now a very technical term to describe what bacteria and some fungi do to create literally a place for themselves to live in. And where it becomes really important in EHO land and out anywhere in public health, and in fact in healthcare, is it represents the interactions between the most dangerous things in the world and the most dangerous things in the world. Okay, so let me give you a little quick outline of the sort of things we're talking about because it's the danger of touch and the proposition of a dental touch and microbial transmission. Now, of course, these can be the love, uh, love hands or the hands of death. Uh, I have a good friend, the late Professor Mary Lou McClaws, who once gave a talk uh, to a bunch of doctors actually and uh, she uh, gave the talk titled Killing Them Softly with a Gentle Touch. And it has to do with the fact that the microorganisms that we live around and live on us and around us generally don't harm us. But occasionally, some of them will get where they shouldn't be and they pose particular threat. And of course, in healthcare, and for EHOs in food preparation, we're particularly concerned about transmitting unwanted microorganisms onto a place where they can cause us harm. And the most frequent way they get there in healthcare and in food preparation is via contaminated hands. And um, biofilms are part of what goes on in this whole contamination area. Now, this might seem a strange little photograph. Here's a intertidal zone. But this is a beautiful illustration of what happens with biofilms because the underlying layer on the intertidal zone, it ends up being a bacterial or fungal layer. So you can see here the tides going out. You've got algae exposed and wet areas and sand and discoloration. But if we were really to go further down, you can see there's, there's a, a sea uh, grasses and uh, anemones, and there'll be starfish and fish, as well as, as kelp and other uh, marine um, organisms there, plants and fauna, and or flora and fauna. And they're living in this area which moves between wet and dry, but the basic form of what's happening in that area to give the other forms of life a, a, a hold on to the rock are bacterial biofilms. And in fact, the best example you've got, you can show us a smile now, Samantha, if you're visual, is your teeth. Because 
on your teeth, you've got a wet, dry surface. And what happens? What do we do with our teeth? Well, if you're following the Australian Dental Association or the World Dental Association's uh, uh, general advice, um, the Federated, Federated Dental Industry, uh, you'll know that you should brush your teeth at least twice a day or when they're visually dirty. And what you're doing is you're removing a biofilm. Your biofilms are also all over us. And in fact, uh, the, the father of what we now know as biofilm, the late Professor uh, Costerton um, from uh, Montana, um, he, he once said that, look, you could look at uh, basically from the top to the bottom of your alimentary canal, everything in the middle, um, all your fecal material is all a giant biofilm. It's bugs forming and feeding and moving from place to place. But we also know that biofilms grow on dry surfaces. Now, this is a, a micrograph taken from a seminal paper from our group uh, by Emeritus Professor Karen Vickery, at, uh, who was at Macquarie University up until recently, still is nominally. And this is a, 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 a series of photographs uh, uh, from a scanning electron microscope where we literally cut up an old intensive care unit. It had been double terminally disinfected with a thousand parts per million of chlorine. So that's a thousand times the strength of chlorine that you would have in a municipal swimming pool. And what we found on those dry surfaces when we looked at them to recover the microorganisms and under the scanning electron microscope were lots and lots of biofilm. And my favorite is the one on the bottom right hand corner, which is labeled D, where you can see the beautiful rayon cord and then the spider webby like nature of a biofilm. But, but in fact, at all those different locations and the arrows are pointing to biofilm and different microorganisms that were present. And on that particular sample, uh, they had things like the sterile reagent bucket. So they're supplying sterile medicines in a bucket and yet the bucket itself had biofilm and multi-resistant organisms in it. Uh, the flexible glass or, or plastic doors that you push through to go into the ICU, we recovered MROs, that is multi-resistant organisms, and biofilm from the doors. Um, the, the curtain that called, the cord that you pulled away, the patient curtain, which is that D image down in the bottom right-hand corner. Again, the, the curtain, the, the, the rope that was attached to it, that's where the biofilm was. And largely they're everywhere. I, I, I was working on a paper today with a co-author that we'll come to in a minute. And uh, we did a study looking at where the biofilms were in a busy ICU. And terrifyingly, we found them everywhere with multi-drug resistant organisms in there. And what happens in a biofilm is the bugs basically build a little house they can hide inside. And that's really important uh, because you might think, oh, well, you just get a stronger disinfectant. But work that we've done, again, through Karen Vickery's group, has shown that we can produce in the lab what happens in life. And in the lab, we've been able to show that once you put some of these standard bugs into a biofilm, a dry surface biofilm or a wet biofilm, they're somewhere between 220,000 times more resistant to disinfecting and to antibiotics. So they get in, they hide, and they are highly protected. We've even shown, or Karen's group has shown, that they will resist autoclaving or steam sterilization. And uh, um, they form what we now know as a persister cells. So they, they get in there and they, they not quite hibernate, but they're locked down tight. And even if they're damaged, they can they have the capacity to self-repair to put themselves back together. So in some of the experiments, uh, Professor Vickery had to cut them off because we ran out of time, but she was very confident that for some of the experiments, we would still have got survivors under the most extreme conditions if we'd have given them enough time to self-repair. And they're difficult to recover because they're in this state. So when you want to recover these bugs, they don't grow back in the normal way. You need to really show them lots of love and lots of care and encourage them to come out of their persistent state and give them the perfect environment to regrow. And that's also important because standard microbial techniques 
will not uncover biofilms on surfaces. So if you're using a standard spread plate or you're using a, a Rodax or standard swabs, you will not find these biofilms on surfaces. You need to use quite specific methods. And here's a piece of work that is truly terrifying. This is work we pioneered as well through Professor Vickery's group. What we've been able to show is what we call the 19 touches rule. That is, once you touch one of these biofilms that's got all these bugs in it, those bugs will stay on your little fingies for up to 19 subsequent touches. What's more, it's not just, we haven't just shown that it's true for your bare hands. We've shown that the same rule exactly applies to gloved hands. What's really interesting is, is if you get wet gloves, so let's say you were doing a cleaning process, you will pick up 10 times the number of bugs, but they'll fall off more quickly. So the bugs love water. They love cleaning solutions. They love to swim. They love to eat. And one of the other things we've been able to show in uh, research that we've published over the last decade is that the most, in the most part, cleaning is done very poorly. And so much of cleaning simply gives these bugs a feed and a drink as a, a cloth, a wet cloth is wiped across. And rather than cleaning things, you smear the surface with all sorts of muck. And uh, this, we don't have time to go into all the research, but there's a rule in terms of uh, cleaning these days that you use for every surface you use one cloth, use it in one direction, and you only use it once, that is for that one surface. And uh, good reason for that, because guess what? The bugs jump on the cloths as well. And there's lots of really good research that shows the cloths can also be a fomite and transfer the bugs from surface to surface to surface. Here's Dr. Jessica Farrell, who's one of our key researchers. Jess is off on maternity leave at the moment, God love her. And uh, she has done an enormous amount of absolutely brilliant pioneering research graduate from the University of Western Sydney and uh, University of Western Sydney College. Um, um, Jess has published some fantastic work and it was in fact today I was working on another paper with her looking at exactly what happens inside of an ICU with dry surface biofilms and bugs like uh, vancomycin resistant enterococci, which is a horrible bug called VRE. And uh, it's got a very high mortality rate in these locations. So where did we find the biofilms? Well, you'll be pleased to hear that we found them everywhere. My favourite is the uh, little object uh, on the top left-hand corner there on your screens, the chair. Guess where the biofilms were? I'm going to use my cursor. But um, of course, when you walk up to a chair, where do you grab? You grab up in this top right-hand corner. The next thing you do is you sit down and you've got the arms. And then what do you do? You adjust the height. So guess where we found the bugs? <laughs> oh yeah, baby, they were all over that chair. And we found them on multiple chairs. And in, in this particular study, we had the chance to destructively sample. So we had really good images. And here is an, a, a workstation, if you will, a clinical workstation. They used to be called nurses' workstations. These days we call them clinical workstations. And guess what? Once again, the bugs were everywhere. Were they on the keyboard? Yes, they were. Were they on the mouse? Yes, they were. Were they on the buttons on the photocopier? You betcha. How about the telephone? <laughs> oh, yes. And, uh, and of course, we've got an image there of a, a portable keyboard. So bring your VRE with you and hop it onto the keyboard and you can take it from room to room and touch to touch. How do you clean a keyboard without destroying it? How do you physically clean some of these areas? And of course, in modern healthcare, so much of the focus in cleaning is around the patient zones, but it's actually those clinical work areas that hardly ever get cleaned. I mean, they're a, a weekly, monthly clean, some of these things. And yet how many times a day does a clinician go to a workstation in a work area to type their notes? Now, the same applies in, in the food sector as much as in the healthcare sector, in the aged care sector, in education of children. Because this is what we now realise is 
this technique of growing biofilms is how these bugs survive. Now, most of the bugs that are in these biofilms are, are harmless, what we call commensals. And it's, you know, there's no need to get, oh, I'm not going to touch anything anymore um, because they're everywhere. What we worry about is in certain contexts where there's vulnerability and risk, that's where we need to have the interventions. And as I said, biofilms in food production areas Here's a lovely micrograph of some beautiful rods. See, you can see in the middle of them, some of them are dividing. Look at that. They're just lovely, lovely. And they've got this all this beautiful biofilm. One of the things they do when they get attacked is they clump together in a three-dimensional way to preserve the cells in the middle. And you can see that there they are on a piece of uh, fabric. And of course, the common link is poor hand hygiene. There is nothing more important in, in uh, practical uh, public health infection prevention and disease transmission prevention than hand hygiene. Um, now, the traditional way, of course, is soap and water under, under a tap, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That is to be endorsed, particularly if you've got visible soil on your hands. But remember the 19 touches. If you had a touch to biofilm, you wouldn't even know that... Uh, you touch that biofilm because, of course, they're microscopic. You can't physically see them. When, when a clinician goes to pull the chair back, whether it's a doctor or a nurse or a paraclinical worker, such as a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, whoever it is, they just pull the chair back. They don't think, oh, well, this chair will undoubtedly be contaminated with vancomycin resistant enterococca. It'll be all over my hands. I'll have to wash my hands again. No, they don't think that. They just pull the chair out, sit down, adjust the height, start typing away and go back to what they're doing. Um, and if in the uh, healthcare context, we've got this thing called the five moments of hand hygiene that they should be following. And again, the late Professor Mary Lou McClaws did some brilliant work showing that the reported rates of compliance of, of the five moments is, is, is a completely deceptive number. Uh, the actual compliance rates when you measure them properly are much lower. And that's how hands, even in healthcare, transmit. And of course, these days, we're using uh, alcohol-based hand rubs. Um, to, to work, they've got to be more than 70% by volume uh, alcohol, whether that's ethanol or isopropanol. Can't be methanol, but certainly ethanol and isopropanol. And those, those hand rubs are absolutely perfect for the majority of applications, the majority of contexts. They work almost instantaneously because they dehydrate the bugs, but certainly more than 30 seconds, and you'll have taken out all of the transients that might end up on your skin. So what are some conclusions? Well, bugs get onto the surfaces, all very normal. The bugs form a biofilm and they hide inside, all very normal. The bugs become sister cells. Oh, oh now we've got a problem because <laughs> they're, they're not wanting to leave. Get out there like the unwanted relative who stays after Christmas or New Year. Um, the bugs can survive in that status for a long time. Other work that we did showed that when we took those samples out of that ICU and we stored them under controlled conditions, they lasted for more than two years and came back. Um, normal disinfectants don't work. Um, you have to clean and remove a biofilm. It's a lot more difficult than people realise. One thing we don't have the chance to go into, but I've certainly talked on this in previous EHA meetings, is, you know, there are nine separate variables in the simple act of wiping a surface clean. Nine variables to control, who would have thought? And so cleaning becomes very complex, uh, particularly in some of these healthcare areas and in the food area. So the key lesson is you've always got to remember to wash your hands or ABR your hands regularly. And... Hi everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Samantha and I'm the National Communications Officer for EHA. Uh, as Phil mentioned, he had a previous engagement he needed to fly off to, so I will be concluding the live chat today. Our final presentation today has been pre-recorded by Dr. Damika Magana Arachichi, who is uh, based in Sri Lanka. Her presentation focuses on air quality and specific hazing events. So if you'll give me a moment, I'll pull that up on screen and we will get going. Thank you, Samantha, for in, in, uh, inviting me to this uh, webinar. 
Actually, the title is Transboundary Haze Events. And uh, why I choose this uh, topic is that, uh, I mean, we know that the air pollution, it's a global problem and the greatest environmental risk to health, uh, whether it is rich or poor, we all, when we expose to air and if it is polluted, we will fall sick. And coming into your theme uh, this year, global environmental public health, standing up to protect everyone's health each and every day, the air pollution, it's a great major problem we need to address too. And coming into my topic today, it's regarding transboundary haze events. Because these events received noticeable attention recently due to their frequent occurrences. Here the photograph I have put, it is taken in... Colombo, that is capital city of Sri Lanka, during an haze event. And what is haze event? These are defined as the unexpected rise of dry particulate matter in the atmosphere. And from this, it blocks the clearness of the air. And these two photographs, which I have put here, are given in the newspapers taken by in December last year, when our country faced a haze event, that is due to the other, I mean, it is originated not in Sri Lanka, but it came through with the winds. And for the reasons for these haze events, mostly the farming practices, burning of straw, and open coal for our plants, and also forest fires. I mean, a lot of causes are given, but it is long-term effects of anthropogenic activities. From these activities, hazardous pollutants released into the air and could get transported through dry fog winds to neighboring countries. Resulting in mist events, that means these events, they cross international boundaries. And these are some of the case studies I am showing you. It's in the first study, I investigated the microbial quality of air during the transboundary haze event occurred in Sri Lanka, that is last December 2022. And due to a storm in the Bay of Bengal, the haze crossed international boundaries and came over to Sri Lanka, affecting the whole country. This is Sri Lanka and this is India. And here you can see the winds which travel past Sri Lanka. This was clearly visible as mist and fog in different parts of Sri Lanka during the event's peak days. And we know that the air quality index, AQI, should be between 0 and 50 to consider a satisfactory level of breathing. And according to the news reports, India's air quality index suddenly rose very unhealthy levels at the end of November 2022. And according to Sri Lankan National Building Research Organization report, in Sri Lanka, it rose to unhealthy levels, peaking about at about 200 from 7th of December 2022. And this persisted for a week, and especially 
It was all over the country in Colombo, Gampaha, Kandy, and Jaffna districts. And my <clears throat> research institute is in Kandy, and it has also become one of the most polluted cities in Sri Lanka. These are some photographs of the Colombo city during last December. The whole city was covered with mist. And these were the photos taken from our, I mean, I took these photographs and you can see that the fog covering the city of Kandy. In this study, what we did was we collected air samples during the hazy days and non-hazy days. And we used an air sampler to collect the samples. And also in that particular air sampler, we, there were two types of filters. Depending on the pore sizes, we could collect different types of samples. And also sampling was performed for three times per day, morning, noon, and evening. And I am not going into the methodology. What we thought of to determine the estimation of total microbial load, because from that we can see the number of microorganisms attaching to these dust particles uh, when in a normal day, as well as in a hazy day. And when we conducted the total microbial load, I say, TML was 3.5 fold higher on hazy days than on non-hazy days. And here you can see that what has happened. It will be peak around noon, and these were the data which obtained for the hazy day. And this is a non-hazy day recording. The highest microbial load was obtained on the fourth day of the sample collection. It was at its peak around noon. that is around 6.67 into 10 to the power of five cells per me cubic meter air. And also we could see a significant difference uh, depending on the sample collection method. But uh, when it came to the uh, weather conditions, uh, it was uh, not, the conditions were not, not significant, but there has been an influence depending on the humidity and also atmospheric temperature. And in these four photographs, you can see that the A and the B are on hazy days, that is, in the month of December, 14th morning, 11 a.m., this was taken. And in the evening, 4 p.m. And here, you can cl see clearly the difference between the pattern of the environmental, I mean, air condition. The, this is on a non-hazy day. It's the same, around same time, 11 a.m., and here also, it's also an evening of around 4 p.m. on 30th. That is, the event was over. And what we need to consider is that with these dust particles, it can enter our lungs and also it can get deposited in our alveoli. Because of the smaller, when it is smaller, the size of the particle, the organisms attached, that is viruses and gaseous contaminants, can be adhered onto those 
and get deposited in our respiratory system. And not only respiratory systems, even other organs get affected. The interesting feature is that when we use an air sampler to collect samples, we can correlate these, the size of the particles and the organisms attached onto those and do a comparative study with our human lungs. And the same incident happened in the year 2019. These were the photos which was taken. These were from the city of Colombo in 2019, November 20th. And this was on 7th of November 2019. The same incident. And there also, we did the study from the city of Kalam, uh, sorry, city of Kandy. And there also, we collected samples in that, during that session, uh, hazy days as all, and also during non-hazy days. The key points there was, we were able to obtain 12 culturable bacterial species Highest number was on the 7th November 2019. And compared to the control of each method, hazy days showed a high bacterial load around 40%. And also four human pathogenic bacterial species were identified. And we published our findings and the his episode in 2019 reported a tenfold higher value than non hazy days. But in 2022 study, the increase was around 3.5 fold increase. And in our 2022 study, we tentatively identified bacillus species on hazy and non hazy days but pseudomonas species were identified on hazy days. And as this is an ongoing study, because we need to do the molecular uh, investigations to find out the species. And to conclude my presentation, what I want to say is that the findings reveal that there is a potential that these fine particles could travel deeply to the lower respiratory tract and cause severe respiratory distress. Because airborne microorganisms could stick to these fine particles and enter the respiratory system, triggering pulmonary diseases. And what we should learn from is that transboundary cooperation is important because it will promote better understanding and exchange of knowledge and concerns between neighboring countries. Because these events originates in one country, but it, the effect will be to another country. Therefore, we need to have collective responses to shared problems such as transboundary haze pollution, allowing new opportunities and ways of overcoming these common threats. Thank you. So thank you for joining us for our belated World Environmental Health Day live chat. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed the event as much as I have and maybe even learned something new today. I did want to take this opportunity again to thank all of our fantastic speakers for taking the time to be a part of today's live chat and to share their knowledge and experience with everyone. Lastly, if you'd like any information about environmental health, environmental health officers or EHA um, or any of the organisations that our speakers are a part of, just visit the EHA website or send an email directly to me at this email here. Thank you again for joining us. I hope everyone had a fantastic World Environmental Health Day a few weeks ago and continue to enjoy your beautiful week this week. Uh, any questions, again, send them through to this email and we'll see you for our next live chat event. Bye now.